Welcome to the Apartment Building Investment Podcast. I am your host, Michael Blanc. I am super excited you're here to learn with us about apartment buildings, the best way to achieve financial freedom. Today, we're actually going to mix things up. Like, I have a co-host on the show today. Just make it a little more interesting. That's right, a co-host. His name is Drew Whitson. He's been on the show before. And I thought, hey, shoot, let's bring him on the show. Drew, how's it going? Good, Michael. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. This is going to be a really cool show. Let's get right into the show with uh, Josh Gorogovsky. Josh, welcome to the show today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're a young guy. How, how old are you right now? I'm 26. 26. Okay. And then you got started in real estate several years ago. So when you actually got sort of started in real estate, how old were you at the time? Uh, I started my informal internship, mentorship around 21. Got super young. And it's, it sounds like you're, you're just out of school or you're in school. What, what, like, no, let me ask you this. What was going on at the mm -hmm. time that you wanted to get into real estate? Like, God, and the reason I ask is, most people, you know, they work 15 years before they come to the realization that you did, which is like, oh, I got to get out of this insanity. And you were like off school, partying, having a good time. <clears throat> and then why did you feel like you wanted it, needed to get into real estate? So I went to uh, USC, I was here local in Los Angeles, and I was kind of playing around with different career uh, ideas. I, I was thinking about maybe going to sports agency, and then I was playing around with the idea of going into uh, the entertainment industry. And after getting a taste of a few different things, uh, I just realized that, you know, hey, maybe I should just enjoy sports from the sideline, entertainment from the sideline, and you don't have to, like, be involved in it to, uh, to enjoy it. So uh, I stumbled upon the book, just like most people and, and you, uh, Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it was kind of a, a aha moment for me. Um, so from that point forward, I was introduced to my now mentor um, through a family friend. And after seeing his lifestyle and intertwining that with what I learned from the book, I, there was no turning back after that. That's really impressive, Josh. So I did remember from your bio that you actually got a degree in real estate finance. Can you tell us how that related to your initial strategy and how that's evolved? So the, the overall degree was business administration, but at USC you can kind of emphasize in different things. So I emphasized in the, in the real estate finance aspect of it. So I took a few like extra courses in it. But yeah, it was, it was right around my senior year where I decided I was going to move forward with this one way or another. So that's when I, I started learning the, uh, the numbers behind, behind uh, the industry. Did you find that useful? Like, would you recommend that or did you kind of like? Yeah, it's a good foundation. You know, nothing's going to teach you like going through it, but it was definitely a, a good foundation for me. And I'm not by any means a numbers guy um, or, or, you know, I was the kid that grew up hating math and all those things. So for me, it was a very, solid foundation okay so you're, you're you're 23 what's your initial strategy to break into the the real estate market what was the first couple things you did the first few things i did as i found somebody who was doing exactly what i wanted to do i i was one of the lucky ones who got a warm introduction you know i know a lot of people don't have that luxury but i was lucky in that sense so um, i met somebody who was doing exactly what i at the time thought i wanted to do um so I was very persistent. I come from a sales background. Uh, you know, I was a telemarketer from the age of 15. So I was just very persistent following up with him. And even though he didn't want to offer me a job or, or even a real internship, uh, I did what I could to just stay around. And I put in the time after school and, and then later on uh, after work to really understand the fundamentals and the numbers uh, before I dived fully into it. Well, hold on. before we get to this mentor, why in the yeah. world were you a telemarketer at 15? Like, that's not a normal, <laughs> that's not a normal kid job, right? You work at Chick-fil-A or something. What's the matter with yeah, you? How well, did that come about? Well, like most of us, it's, it was girls. So, uh, I, uh, I had a girl, I had a girlfriend at the time and I went on, on two dates with her that my mom paid for. And I came back to her for the third date and she goes, nah, I'm not, I'm not financing your dates. You need to go get a job. So my uncle had a home improvement company and they had a bunch of telemarketers. So I just, uh, I took the, I took the job that I could get. And how did that prepare you for, you know, get back and get back in your mentor? How did that telemarketing like prepare you for doing what you're about to do? Definitely teaches you how to deal with uh, rejection. So that's good. Works in work, also works at the bars now. Um, so it helps you deal with the rejection for sure. Um, to build up the, the routines and the systems that you need in, in this type of job to be organized, to follow up, um, obviously to 
deal with different types of personalities. So it, again, along with like the real estate finance thing, it was just a very good foundation, especially at such a young age, uh, calling, you know, adults and getting uh, cursed out by them to, to build, build a backbone. Josh, one of the things I see in my coaching students um, in the mentor program is really pushing these kind of pushing to get out and, and get comfortable with getting rejections and, and saying no yeah. uh, and getting those no's. And you, you certainly had a, a great base for doing that. Um, how did your mentor help you get started? What are some of the things the mentor sort of pushed you down some of the first steps from, from their guidance? Uh, so once I started getting a little more embraced for my, for my efforts, uh, it was really, um, first of all, become a master of some kind of niche. Don't become a jack of all trades. So if there's a certain asset class that draws you or a certain market that draws you, then, um, then focus on that and become very, very intimate with that. Um, and then just really start honing in on numbers. That was the first thing that I focused in on because I didn't have an ability to get into construction or managing any kind of units or anything else since I had no experience. So for me, it was just learning the numbers and identifying what's a good, what's a good deal. So yeah, it's just about focusing in on that at first. So focus, focusing on that, maybe we'll get a little more detail about it, but I, I, I don't know how you got into this guy because it sounds like it wasn't like you didn't call this guy up and goes, Oh, Josh, come on over. Let's work together. Like how yeah, did you, actually, yeah. how did you get him to take you on and what were you doing for him to get on? Like, were you making coffee for him? Like getting him like what, you know what? Like how did you get yourself in the door with this guy? Yeah, it was, it was actually the opposite. It was, um, you know, I would follow up and every month while I was still in school, ask for some kind of internship. Can I come after class? Can I come on weekends? And very, very politely, very nice guy just kind of told me to kick rocks. You know, like, I don't, I don't need you. I, I, I don't have a need for an intern or an employee right now. So, uh, for me, my whole mindset was I'm going to find this guy a deal. That was my way in because if I find this guy a deal, then maybe I don't, even if I don't get a piece of the deal financially, I at least have some kind of leverage where maybe I could say, Hey, can I be involved to, in some capacity to learn? So that was my goal. And, uh, after months and months of following up, picking his brain, um, I had a, a job offer from a large tech company after college. It was a sales job, so it's what I knew. I felt like I could take that job. The hours were not so crazy, so I could still kind of focus on real estate when I wasn't working. And when um, I had that job lined up, I approached him again and said, hey, look, no pressure on you to hire me when I'm, when I'm done with school. Just let me come around and, and learn and, and see what, what's a deal for you, and, and you know, then I'll be on my way. So he agreed to that for whatever reason, and ended up liking me and uh, the, the effort that I was putting in. So from that point forward, when I started that tech job, he was letting me come in after work, you know, gave me, actually this, this was my first office. I'm still in his office. This, this was a storage closet. So he let me come in here on this desk and kind of just come in after work. I come in at like four o'clock after my seven to four. And then from like four to 9 PM, my whole focus was just buying this guy a deal. How long were you able to keep up both of those, both those gigs? Like how, how long did you go both time with the, the full-time tech and then about a year, about a year. And how about financially year. stable were you when you sort of made the leap outside of your full-time job and just said you committed both your entire sort of time and focus into real estate. Tell me how's that transition went. So uh, it was, it was a tech job. I was making okay money. It wasn't uh, fantastic where I had a crazy amount of savings but uh, I actually had sort of a, if you want to call it a training wheels type of entry. There was a, a friend of his who was a hard money lender. And I'm sure a lot of your audience knows what that is. Um, so he was a lender and he wanted to get a little bit more into the investment space, but they didn't have the time or capacity to focus on investments. So I was referred over to him. Uh, he paid me a similar type of ordeal that I had at the tech company, which was perfect for me and pretty much just said, here you go. Just run my, the tech side of my business, just me and him. So it was a small, we were looking for smaller deals. It wasn't anything crazy. Um, so I did that for another year before going solo. So that was a very good cushioned transition for me where I was learning how to get things going in the industry, but at the same time still had the, cushion of, of some sort of income. At one point, did you then actually leave your job though? 
Yeah, that was, so I was a year at the tech company, a year with the hard money lender, and then after that point, I was solo dolo. Now, what gave you the confidence to go solo, though? I mean, did you have a pipeline? Did you have a deal at that point? Did you see a pipeline for like why? You know, what gave you the confidence that you could do that? Uh, a few other things. I mean, I have the luxury of having my family and parents here in the same city as me. So uh, I, you know, I, w I went, I took a few steps back, left, uh, you know, no, the single apartment to myself type of life. I went back home. Oh, you and did. You slept on your parents. I, nice. Yeah, I slept, yeah, nice. I slept back in my parents' place. I did that for a while. And I had the, um, you know, I had the luxury of having a fantastic mentor who was willing to, to teach me. And I, I just really believed in myself. I felt like mm. um, I, if I put in the time and the efforts, that it was going to materialize one way or another. And I was okay, um, you know, eating dirt for a while. I was okay with... Uh, not, you know, spending tons of money and going out with friends and doing all these things that you need to do when you're starting any kind of business. So I just, um, you know, I took, I took the, I took the chance. I, I love hearing how you were so persistent uh, with both of these contacts with your mentor saying, look, the only value I can add is solving a problem that's getting this guy a deal. Um, the other hard money lender sounds like you said, look, I'm just going to take over things that he needs help with. Right. And you sir, were able over those time period to really absorb a lot of their experience and their knowledge and really begin to network. So you left your full-time job. You've had a couple years of sort of being supporting these really sort of a, uh, uh, successful um, sort of mentors that have given you some opportunities. Tell us about your first deal. How did you leap that into your very own deal that you, that you spearheaded? Um, yeah. So in the beginning, you know, because I didn't have projects to manage, I didn't have units to manage. All I was spending my time on was finding a deal. So I was, uh, you know, trying a lot of different things and I was, this is how like neurotic I am with my organization and my, in my mind, like I was counting the hours it was taking me to find a deal. So it took me exactly 900 hours to find my first deal. <laughs> wow. So uh, this one came off of a mailer that I dropped off. I would just go around neighborhoods and, you know, door knock, drop letters, do things like that. Mostly on the weekends, but sometimes during the week. And it was just right place, right time. Really nice homeowner. Was a, it was the right time for him to sell. He had another property in Hawaii. He was ready to retire. So we ended up buying that property with the hard money lender. And um, it was kind of the ordeal that I mentioned earlier that I wanted to come into with, with my mentor, which was, you know, I found the deal and now let me kind of just step back and kind of watch it happen and help wherever I can. So that, that's kind of, I was very hands off during the actual construction and management and sales process of the deal. I had a little input, but for me, it was just about learning on that first one. So you actually found this deal and brought it to your mentor? No, to the, the hard money lender. The hard money lender. Okay. Yeah. All right. But he mm -hmm. was in charge of the deal or who was in charge of the deal? He was. He was. He was. Yeah. See, I, I mm -hmm. love that. And there's a lot of people say, I got to, I have to do my, I have to control my first deal, my second deal. Like, really? Is that really that important? Right. What's important is getting the deal done. You weren't in charge, but you were along for the ride and you learned a lot. Yeah, exactly. And that's what led to all the other ones. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. So who knows if that deal would have worked out or it may have just, you know, completely... I don't know if it would have killed my career, but it, you know, it could have been could have been really bad if, if I if it wasn't done correctly. So did you did you make some money on this deal? Were you compensated as royalty or equity, or how, how did it? What, what did that look like for you? Yes, yeah, so I, I was paid the the salary as I mentioned, right? And then the agreement was also that I get a small piece of the equity as well. So I was I was given a small piece of the equity. Yeah. Congratulations. That's awesome. But you probably would have done it for free, just in, in what you said oh, so yeah, far. For yeah, sure. yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, how, yeah, for, for, I mean, all, anybody coming in early needs to be willing to learn first, right? Like you got to walk before you run. So I understood that. Talk about the second deal, third deal. Like what, what was the progression like? Um, that deal was a, the first one was a, a single family rehabilitation project. And I realized from that deal that I wasn't crazy about rehabs. I mean, they're fine, but like, I knew that there was a lot of things that could go wrong and they're unanticipated. And I didn't have the construction eye at the time where I could walk in and say, okay, you know, this is my budget and, oh, I, I know this needs to be replaced. So, so for me, it was a little more risky and I thought that new construction was less risky because you kind of know what you're getting into, how much lumber you need, how much stucco the building is going to require, so on and so forth. So my second project was a ground up duplex development. 
um, that I did on my own with a uh, family friend as my and one of my uh, as my first uh, uh, private investor. So they put up the capital. I found, uh, developed, and and then managed the asset once it's finished. It's still in our portfolio um, and doing well. So that was the second deal. Tell me about the conversation with that investor when you're trying to have your very first investor putting capital into the first deal that you've run. How did that conversation go? What were the things that you needed to communicate um, to sort of get that, that level of confidence, getting your first investor on board? Well, again, I, I, I understand that I had a lot of things going for me. Yes, I put in the work and I'm not taking anything away from myself, but also I had a, li- a lot of things going for me. So um, I had that first deal that was finished and I kind of went to him and, you know, talked about all the things that I learned, what to do, what not to do. Um, I understood the numbers pretty well at this point. So I was able to justify everything that I was putting on paper. And, uh, and I had the resources now because after – going through this for a while, uh, the mentor felt comfortable sharing a few of his resources. So I had, I had some of the guys that can get the work done at a, a reasonable price, which is how the deals end up penciling. So, you know, just putting all this on paper in a nice little presentation. And it was a family friend that's known me since I was born. So it's a, a little different than it just approaching some guy on the street. Right. So, uh, but still, kind of, you know, he did a good job of like treating it like a real, a real, um, pitch that he wanted me to present to him. So I'm just curious, since you tracked your first, your first deal took you 900 hours. Did you track how many hours it took you to get from deal one to deal two? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. But it was, uh, I think it was like four months after that. Okay. Yeah. So, so roughly the same amount, like a same amount of uh, months, but less uh, grassroots time, like door knocking and stuff like that. Yeah, that's interesting. And now how did you, now you've since then raised like millions of dollars since, since that one investor how did you go about scaling up the capital raise and scaling up the, the, the deals that you're, you're buying? How did you do that? I just kept the ball rolling. Uh, I used the leverage of each project to go to the next. And thankfully, they were going well, and I was hitting the numbers that I thought I was going to hit. So I never you know, let my foot off the gas. I kept going to networking events. I kept uh, cold calling. I kept reaching out and networking with agents. And that allowed it to kind of uh, snowball into, you know, one deal goes to two, two goes to three, and it just continuously kept expanding. Great. So bring us up to today. So you were off to the races, right? You got your, your, your investor base, you got your deal flow. Tell us where you're, where you're at today. Today we have, we have um, eight development projects in the works. Um, I currently have uh, six units under management. We just sold a fourplex. It would have been 10, so we sold that. So it's six. Uh, by the end of next year, we should be at 30 units under management. And those are mo- all construction. Uh, they're all new construction uh, deals. And that's been our model. We're be- we've been doing the, uh, the build to rent. It's been working for us. It's been working for our investors. And um, we're going to keep it going. And wh- where is this? This is in LA, right? Oh, Los Angeles. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So ground up, mm-hmm. duplex, small, small, and then you rent them. So build a build a rent, and that yeah. works. <laughs> that works because you can build for a lot less than what you can buy the same thing. Is that fundamentally is that why it exactly. works? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Our 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 return on cost is is much better than any capital than you can just go buy in Los Angeles. Yeah. It, it, I don't blame you for for st- stumbling on it because I remember we flipped three dozen houses and sometimes you're like. You know, it'd just be easier to rip this thing down. Like, really? Yeah. yeah down yeah. to the studs, and you're like, well, really? Just, just bulldoze it, you know? So I don't blame you for going from, you know, really bad rehab. I like just to start from scratch. So it's a lot easier. <laughs> and so you kind of stumbled yeah, exactly. on you stumbled on something that works in L.A., right? Uh, or, or even other places like the Bay Area or just large cities where you could never buy a cash-flowing existing multifamily, but you could build one, and that's kind of what you're doing right now uh, as well. Right. Exactly. So what's kind of next for you? Like what's on the, what's on the horizon? You know, for me, uh, I don't, I don't believe that I have enough experience in this field yet to kind of go off and do other things. I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now. So I'm going to keep it going. I'm going to, I like the model that we have with the build to rent. I'm going to keep uh, building those, maybe sell one ever so often to generate more capital, still doing a few single family uh, rehab deals whenever we can get our hands on them. And then, you know, I'll revisit maybe in the next few years about either developing something larger or getting into the multifamily syndication for existing 
multifamily, whether it's LA or, you know, nationwide. But for now, I'm going to, I'm going to keep this going. So Josh, looking back at your time, what are, what is a couple of things that you wish you knew when you got started that you know now? Like, what would you go back and tell your, your, your younger self getting into this business? I definitely don't, you know, regret anything that I've done. Um, I guess, I guess I would just tell myself to keep going, which is what I, what I was telling myself all the time. You know, when you get started, it's, you get down on yourself, uh, no matter what, I don't think, it doesn't matter what in industry and whether you're starting a business or, you know, you're starting a new career. I, I think that, um, people like us are, are wired to want to succeed and, and hit certain goals of theirs. And when it doesn't happen as fast as you want it to, you kind of get down on yourself and question yourself. So I would, uh, go back and give myself a few pep talks and, just you know keep, well, keep going man how did you overcome those times because you're right it's not every it's not every every day is not always the best day you you, you get down yeah. yourself um how did you get through those those instances i just i had an innate belief in myself and i i knew that i was going to get there and um you know i i listened to a lot of these guys uh, online, the Gary Vaynerchuks of the world and the David Goggins of the world, you know, that, and they make a lot of sense with what they say. I also, like I said, have a, have a, I'm blessed to have a great mentor who um, gave me those pep talks as well when I needed it and a great family, great friends. So I just have a really great supporting cast that uh, never let me get too down on myself. I love that, Josh, that, that sort of positive self-talk. Sounds like you gave yourself a lot of really good talks back when you were younger. So <laughs> congratulations on doing that. That's it doesn't sound like you, Lost track of anything there. Well done. No, try it. Thanks, man. All right. So what's your advice to people who kind of want to do what you've done? And, and one of those is typically, you know, normally people say, I wish I had gotten st- started earlier, which I suppose right. you could have, but you already started pretty early. So, you know, but, but seriously, if someone, you know, wants to do what you've done, what's, uh, you know, what's, uh, what's a couple things maybe that you would pass along? One would probably be, you know, and again, everybody's, everybody's uh, roadmap is different. Everybody has a different path. Uh, so I don't expect anybody to be as psychotic or go through the, 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 the growing pains that I did. But if you, if you could find somebody to get you your master's degree in whatever you want to do, that's what I call it, then, then go ahead and, and do that. Do whatever you can to provide them some value and just stick around them because being around them and witnessing firsthand and if you're lucky enough to actually work with them in the field of what you want to do, then that's going to be more valuable than, you know, any degree, in my opinion, that you can hang on your wall. That's your real master's degree. So um, that's probably the most uh, important one for me. Yeah, I, I agree because your mentor got you started in the, in the business and can continue supporting you and encouraging you as well. So without that, you know, where would you be right now? I mean, it'd be, man, who knows? Right? You probably would have figured out a way. And, and, and sometimes I drew, and you know, you, you see a lot of students as well. I, I don't think everybody needs mentorship and everybody uh, will figure it out at one point. It just would have taken a lot longer, right? Would you agree? Yeah, for sure. What else? <clears throat> what else comes to mind? I would say get a taste of everything. You know, um, I've heard a lot of people say, focus on your niche, right? Uh, especially when you get started. But I don't know if you will be able to figure out what that niche is if you don't taste a little bit of everything or at least study a little bit of everything. So, um, and even within a specific niche, you know, if I'm if within a specific a- asset class, not everybody has to wear all the hats. So you may enjoy development. You may enjoy the acquisitions side of things. You may enjoy asset management. So, um, I think getting a taste of everything is, is super important as well. Anything else? You're on a, you're on a roll, uh, man. Don't let me stop you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't become a telemarketer. <laughs> uh, no, <I'm> just <laughs> what else um i i just think that uh those two things are super important and then maybe last um just make sure that you're providing value to everybody that you work with um if you're if you're trying to crack into the industry and you're trying to you know learn from somebody like i did provide them some some kind of value not everybody's going to want to just teach you just to teach you because they have the spare time to do so so figure out a way where you can provide some value. And then even if you're in the industry, I mean, how do you provide value to your vendors, to your contractors, to your the agents that you work with, so on and so forth, your investors, obviously. Um, so just never stop providing value and getting comfortable. When you talk about your niche, right? One of the things, yeah. the niche is that you are grew up and you live in Southern California, you're doing projects in Southern California, yeah. your investors are probably from Southern California. 
Um, I think one of the great advantages that you have is that you, you're sort of playing in your own sandbox there in terms of the advantages you have in your market. Do you see people that ask about chasing other markets? They've, there's sort of a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow at some sort of amazing market. How much of being local from all those had helped make you successful and help define your niche in that market? Yeah, of course. I mean, grass is always greener on the other side. And, and I'm a true believer that there are deals to be found wherever you are. Um, it's just what I like to do. And I'm not saying what I'm doing is the absolute right way of doing it. Um, and I may eventually venture into other cities and states. But um, yeah, there's definitely an advantage. I obviously learned more as I've been in the industry. But um, right off the bat, I mean, I knew certain pockets. I knew which areas are better than others, which ones are going through redevelopment phases and um, which ones to kind of stay away from at this time. So yeah, there's definitely an advantage of playing in your own, in your own sandbox. But I did, especially in, in times where it was hard to find a deal. I, I, I went to El Paso to, I flew to El Paso to try to find deals over there. Um, I've looked in other, in other markets and um, yeah, for now I just, I am sticking, sticking with the backyard. I love that. Uh, you have every advantage in your own home market. Um, both from an investor side and from a deal side. So that's that's wise. That's great. Great strategy. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's great. You know, you stumbled on a niche that works in your local market. Uh, you know, when we're buying existing multifamily, sometimes we can't do that. We have to go outside. Um, right. And so it's, it's, uh, it sounds like you're, you're able to scale that pretty good as well. It's been great, Josh. <clears throat> um, how can people find you, connect with you? Yeah, thank you for having me, obviously. And um, I'm online on all those social media except Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram, Facebook. Um, my website, tellusproperties.com. Uh, people can email me, josh at tellusproperties.com. And uh, you can see me on all those social media accounts. Awesome. Well, great for being, uh, thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate the time. Okay, so I don't want anyone telling me that they're too young, they're too old. They don't have money. They have an experience, okay? Because all of it is horse manure, all right? And I love bringing people like like Josh on the show because they they literally do things despite all odds. And the thing is, these are not isolated incidents. So, Drew, I mean, what what stood out from uh, from what Josh was uh, was telling us? Yeah. So one of the big things I heard is that he got used to getting rejected. He went out. He was a telemarketer. He made hundreds of thousands of calls, and he got used to hearing no. And what a powerful skill to to develop. What a powerful way to uh, go after these in these an entrepreneurial pursuits to be able to get used to hearing no, to be able to get used to hearing rejection. But he it it, it it calloused him up. He became a, uh, he became ready to go and kept just pursuing on to his goals. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I think sales skills are so important developing those sales skills. And you can learn this. Like for example, uh, my 18 year old daughter literally signed up for Cutco. Drew, I don't know if you know this. She did this like, I don't know, two months ago. And I was, are you kidding? She's not really a salesy person at all. I'm going to sign up for this training. I said, really? That's amazing. And the training she got was amazing. It's like you create a list, you call people, you set appointments, you have to pitch them and stuff like that. And that was very uncomfortable for her to do. And I think I would advise everyone to acquire sales skills. There's seminars you can you can take. There's there's books you can do. You can literally uh, attend sale, uh, training classes like that. So sales skills, I think, are super, super important. Uh, the other thing also is hustle. Like the hustle and the persistence, how he got into his mentor. Because I, I he took him a long time. And this guy didn't want anything to do with him. He was like, I don't need you. I don't need an intern. I don't need the internet. I don't need anyway. And so he's, he stayed, uh, stayed with him. And then he looked for ways to provide value. I'm going to bring you a deal. I'm going to bring you a deal. And, and so I, I love the hustle he had. And that's literally what everybody has. And you know this, Drew. I mean, the thing, one thing that everybody has in common, it's not experience, money, demographic. It's, it's hustle. Just hustle, just getting stuff done. Hustle. And not just hustle, but he was constantly willing to learn. He was very humble about finding the right people to mentor, finding ways to add value. And he said all the time, I just kept a step back and tried to learn everything I possibly could about the deal and try to absorb that. So he was constantly looking for ways to sort of educate himself, uh, whether it was you know just practical engagement with these mentors um, in these projects. And he's willing, here's the other thing, he, to, a, to a large degree, he was willing to sacrifice on multiple levels. First of all, he's willing to work for free. I love that. In fact, even in Rich Dad book, you know, he they, they worked for free. That's how they got into it. I love the idea of working for free or for peanuts, essentially. He also was willing to live at home, okay? Now, living at home is probably not all, not probably the best thing, and it requires a little bit of swallowing your pride of, of living at home as well. He said, I was prepared to eat dirt, and I love that. 
I love that. I, I love that that picture. He was willing to sacrifice uh, so that he can kind of reap the benefits down the road. I loved and I loved how he kept moving forward even though he was really young. He didn't let his age stop him. He didn't let his capital or his network stop him. He just wanted to keep moving forward. And this is a business that snowballs. It's something that continues to roll on. So as he continues to gain experience, and he's so much farther ahead than uh, where I was when I was 26. So I encourage anyone that hears this, take action today. Move forward and do these things because it slowly builds over time. Uh, and the sooner you start, the more you're going to see those first results and the sooner you will be financially free. Having a mentor is absolutely key. And he certainly had one. It doesn't have to be a paid mentor. It can be an unpaid mentor. But if you do want to invest, if you value mentorship, then check out ours. Uh, we're at themichaelblank.com forward slash mentor. Schedule a call with us and see if that's something you want to do. Because if you are able to do it, it greatly accelerates your success. And you know, interestingly, uh, Drew, we, we have had a single deal desk deal come from mentoring students because they uh, either raise the money himself or they joint venture with each other. So we never see any of those deals, which is great for them. So we're really excited about what we're doing with, the, with that mentoring program. In fact, we guarantee that uh, that uh, people will do their first deal. Otherwise, we keep working with, uh, with them until they do. No one else does that. So we're just really proud of our program and the stuff that we're doing. So, hey, Drew, it's been fun hanging out. Thanks, Michael. I had a great time. All right, guys. Uh, catch you guys in the next episode. <laughs> Hey, and before you leave, make sure you subscribe to my channel below. We put out videos every single week and you don't want to miss it. Also, if you haven't done so already, grab my free ebook here, okay? It's a secret to raising money to buy your first apartment building deal. It's a good one, so grab that. And hey, check out another video.